All right, now we're gonna look at part three. Part three is where we're gonna look at diseases of the heart. And you're gonna notice there's a lot of similarities here to what we saw in part two. Angina pectoris is chest pain. It's a lack of oxygen to your heart and it's a sign of an impeding infarction. It's kind of the warning signal that a bigger heart attack is coming. Now this happens with physical activity. A lot of times when the individuals, because they have a partial blockage that's taking place, when they do physical activity, these blood vessels are going to constrict. This is gonna limit the amount of oxygen going to those areas and we see that then they're gonna to start to want that oxygen that they're not getting the pain then is going to start occurring. Once they rest though, the blood vessels tend to dilate a little bit and we see that blood flow gets restored, it's better again, and the pain starts to go away. We are notorious for this when we say, okay, if it stops hurting in like 10 minutes, I'm not gonna go to the doctor. Okay, we need to pay attention to this kind of thing because it could be our warning signal that something worse is in the works. So how do we treat angina? Well, we wanna decrease the workload of the heart and we can do this by dilating the, the, the blood vessels and we do this by using something like nitroglycerin. Now, if angina is not taken care of, myocardial infarction is going to occur and this is what we call a heart attack. This occurs when the heart does not get enough oxygen. It causes severe chest pain. This also was going to cause the patient to have what we call diaphoresis, which is sweating and nausea. They also will see that the pain gets referred a lot of times down the left arm, especially towards the pinky, as well as the neck and the jaw, okay? Now this can be severe pain where they think somebody is like sitting on their chest, or it could be where they feel like they have unrelieved indigestion, like heartburn. So how do we treat this? How are we gonna treat a heart attack? Well, first we need to give them immediate attention in order to prevent shock. We don't want the patient to go into shock because then it's harder for the body to recover back to homeostasis. We can do this by relieving their respiratory distress. This is where we may end up putting the patient on oxygen. Oxygen out here in the air that you breathe is only about 23%. If we give them a nasal cannula or a mask, we can increase that by a lot and this can help with the demand for oxygen. We wanna to try to decrease the workload of the heart. Now, if cardiac arrest does occur, we're gonna to need to do cardiopulmonary um, resuscitation. This is CPR, okay? So we may need to perform CPR if the heart starts to give out. Some other treatments when we talk about a heart attack is oxygen and pain medication after the fact. Medication to treat an arrhythmia. Sometimes if parts of the heart are damaged, their, their heartbeat is going to be affected, their rhythm's gonna be affected. So medications might be used to help moderate this. Blood clot busting medications, if blood clots are the cause of the heart attack, like a thrombosis. And then of course, education. Education's a big thing here. A lot of individuals who have had heart attacks, they have to undergo what we call cardiac rehab. This is where they're gonna go in and they're going to not just exercise to build their heart up, but a lot of times they're going to receive some education on things that they can change that will help. This includes, of course, stop smoking, maybe changing some things in your diet, and of course, exercising. But exercise may be different here because of the fact that the heart attack has already happened. We're gonna to have to build up slow, all right? So we're not gonna tell them to go run a marathon or anything like that. That would put too much stress on their heart. So we're gonna start slow and sometimes this includes things like water aerobics because it takes off a lot of the pressure of your joints and also your heart. The next one we wanna look at is the hypertensive heart disease. This is a result of long-term hypertension. So this is gonna be hypertension that has not been controlled, okay? And it continues to become a problem. The cause of this is a disease or disorder causing chronic elevation of that blood pressure. So how do we treat this? Well, we need to treat the cause. Why are we having this high blood pressure? Okay, then what can we do to help treat that? Now, the thing is though, a lot of times when we talk about hypertension or high blood pressure, the damage to the heart is already done. So what we're trying to do is control it to where more damage doesn't occur because we can't really cure this issue. All right, what we're trying to do is just control it and manage the rest of the symptoms. 
Another thing that can damage the heart is rheumatic heart disease. Rheumatic heart disease is an autoimmune disorder. This is caused by a streptococcal throat infection. So that's what we call a strep throat infection. If a strep throat infection is left untreated, a rare but very dangerous complication can occur. And this is where the streptococcal bacteria is gonna leave the throat and get into the bloodstream and it's gonna attach to the valves and the structures of the heart. Now this is when your immune system is gonna come in and still fight the invader, but in the process there's some collateral damage. We kill the bacteria off, but we also damage the heart and the valves in the process. Okay, and so the heart valves, the heart tissue itself can be affected. So how do we treat this? Well, one way to try to, to prevent this is to do quick, rapid treatment of streptococcal infections, making sure that we treat them properly to avoid this complication. If the complication does occur though, we need to have rest during the acute stage. We don't want the heart to have to work too hard while your immune system is trying to fight off these invaders. However, if the valves are damaged and the damage cannot be reversed, we may have to do a valve replacement. This valve replacement is going to replace those valves in order to allow the blood to flow properly. Valve replacements can be done with mechanical valves or they can also be um, live tissue like pig and cow valves. The next thing we want to look at is congestive heart failure or what we call CHF. This is when the heart fails to pump the adequate blood supply that your body needs. Again, this is going to develop slowly. It doesn't happen just overnight. It's going to take time. And this increased workload of the heart is going to cause the heart to go undergo hypertrophy. Now, hypertrophy, if you recall, is when the cells are going to get larger because of the demand. So a lot of times congestive heart failure, the individual also has an enlarged heart that's present. So what are some symptoms that we see with congestive heart failure? Well, gradual increase in dyspnea, so difficulty breathing. Tachycardia, their heart rate increases tachypnea where their breathing increase. Neck vein distension, so we see the veins in the arteries, the vessels in the neck start to distend and pop. Edema in the ankles and lower legs. And there is a little bit of a difference when we look at right-sided congestive heart failure and left-sided congestive heart failure. In right-sided congestive heart failure, this leads to congestion in your liver or spleen. But in the left-sided heart failure, it leads to congestion in your lungs. So let's do a little comparison here of right versus left. Now these are just some mnemonics, some study tools that are out there that try to help you be able to tell the difference. And when we look at right-sided heart failure, they use this kind of acronym of AWHEAD. The A stands for anorexia and nausea, so the patient doesn't want to eat, and this is due to the, ve the venous engorgement of the vessels. The vessels are getting larger in the abdominal area, and it makes it where they don't want to eat. However, even though they're not eating, the patient deals with weight gain. This weight gain, though, is due to fluid retention. We also see what we call heptomegaly, and this is going to be where the liver starts to swell edema. The edema is going to happen on both legs and that's why the bipedal is there. And this type of edema, guys, is what we call pitting edema. You can see it here in the picture. It's where you press and then the fingerprint stays. Okay, It pits into the skin because there's so much swelling there. We have ascites and this is going to be accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal cavity, so the cavity that covers the abdominal organs. And then the distended neck veins can occur. With the left-sided heart failure, you see that they use the acronym DUCHAP. When we look here, they have the D for dyspnea, so it's going to be that labored breathing, even when the patient's at rest, when they're not even being active. They also have orthopenia, which is going to be a dyspnea that develops in the recumbent position. So as they're kind of laying back, okay, and they're reclining back and laying flat, it's going to cause more issues. So a lot of times they need to lean forward or they're going to have to like sleep in a recliner or with lots of pillows because laying flat causes them to have breathing issues. They'll have a cough. This cough a lot of times is going to be dry and non-productive. They a lot of times will have what we call hematosis. This is a type of pink or blood tinged sputum that starts to be produced when they cough. 
we see that they would have what we call advantageous breath sounds. This is going to be where they can hear various areas of the lungs having different sounds um, based on the fluid that's accumulating in the lungs. Because we see like we hear like crackles and stuff due to the fluid. And then also we have pulmonary congestion. There's a high pressure in those pulmonary veins and eventually it forces the fluid into the blood. This affects that transfer of oxygen from the alveoli into the blood vessels because the fluid pushes that distance to be greater. And so we see that that's going to be harder for that transition or diffusion of gases to take place. So if you notice, there is a great connection here between the cardiovascular system and the pulmonary system. And we'll see it even more when we get into that respiratory system disorders. Now diagnosis for congestive heart failure is a physical and history. We see a chest x-ray may need to be done as well as an ECG. How do we treat congestive heart failure? Where we want to decrease the workload of the heart, we may use diuretics to get the extra fluid off of the patient. Okay, salt and fluid restriction may be really important because we want to make sure that we're not allowing them to take in too much fluid that they'll retain, as well as salt because salt causes you to also hold on to fluid. Medications to strengthen but also slow the heart rate, and an example of this is digitalis. The next one we're looking at is cardiomyopathy. This is a disease of the heart muscle itself. It's characterized by either a dilated, enlarged, thin, or flabby heart muscle. Okay, so over here in the picture, you can see a normal heart. You can then see a dilated, a hypertrophic, where we see that it's going to get enlarged, and then also a restrictive. Now, there's no cure for cardiomyopathy. It ultimately can lead to congestive heart failure or a myocardial infarction and ultimately death. The next one we want to look at is called carditis. Carditis, guys, is inflammation of the heart, and it gets named specifically about which layer of the heart is inflamed, okay, that has that inflammation. If it's pericarditis, it's the outside part. It's that sac that is around the heart that has the inflammation. If it's myocarditis, it's going to be the heart muscle itself. And if it's endocarditis, it's the inner layer of the heart. This is often secondary to a respiratory, urinary, a respiratory or urinary tract infection or a skin infection. Now treatment for carditis, whether it's peri, myo, or endo, is gonna be rest. Antibiotics, if it's due to a bacterial infection, that's only for bacterial infections. Analgesics, which are painkillers, and also antipyretics, which is to help fight fevers. All right, so depending on what kind of infection it is, we may need to use antibiotics. If it's a viral infection, we're just going to support the body in trying to fight that infection. Another issue with the heart itself is a valvular heart disease. This is going to be a malfunction in those valves we talked about, okay, whether we're talking about the tricuspid or bicuspid, or we're talking about the semilunar valves, whether it's pulmonary or aortic. Now, when valve issues are present, you're going to be able to hear them because the heart will sound different, okay? Because what you hear whenever you're listening to someone's heart is those valves shutting and the blood hitting those valves. So it's like, doo -doo, doo -doo, okay? When we talk about a murmur, a lot of times you hear the, but then you may hear a whoosh because the blood is flowing backwards. It's got a backflow that it should not be present. Now, there's two different types of valvular issues. One is a stenosis, and this is where the valve starts to narrow. Okay, so you can see that in the picture here where the valve is narrowing. On the other hand, you have a regurgitation where it's an insufficient closure. It tries to close, but there's still an opening, and that's where the backflow of blood occurs. Now, what causes these valvular heart diseases? Well, some are congenital, meaning the individual is born with them. There's an abnormality or malformation that took place in how the valves were even formed. We also see that it could be due to issues with that rheumatic fever we talked about where there's damage that's done or even endocarditis could cause this type of damage as well. Again, the main treatment would be valvular replacements. 
The last thing that deals with the heart itself are going to be the arrhythmias. Or the, and when we talk about arrhythmias, these are the abnormal heart rhythms. A sinus rhythm looks like this. We see that it, a normal heart rate is anywhere between 60 to 100 beats per minute. And you have a P, a QRS, and a T wave. Right? If the heart rate gets higher than 100 beats per minute, we call that tachycardia. If the heart rate is lower than 60 beats per minute, we call that bradycardia. Now, if the heart gets unusually fast, they call this a flutter. And if you'll notice that this EKG strip looks very different than the normal one that we should see. Hey, okay, this is a type of flutter. On the other hand, if the heart gets wild and uncoordinated in its contractions, we call this fibrillation. And again, you can see that this strip looks way different than what the normal sinus rhythm strip looks like. So you see how the EKG can give us an indication that something is wrong. Another type of arrhythmia that can take place are called heart blocks. A heart block is an interruption in the conduction system. So there's a blocking. Remember, we're supposed to talk from SA node to AV node to, to the bundle of his, to the right and left branches, and the Purkinje fibers. That's the sequence. But when we talk about a heart block, normally there's a block between the SA node and that AV node. This is normally an AV node problem. And this can develop blocks that we either call first, second, or third degree blocks. So what happens here in these blocks is a lot of times that communication is going to be seen as there being an issue where there's a longer period than it should be. Like you see here in this first degree block, you see the space between the P wave and the QRS is very long. That means the communication between the SA node and the AV node has not taken place like it should have. If this continues to get worse, it can go to a second degree block where you can see that they actually skip heartbeats. Hey, you can see that there's a P wave, there's no QRS, and then there's another P wave. Hey, so heartbeats are skipped. Again, it can progress more and more to where more heartbeats are skipped till we get to a third degree block. And if you look at the third degree block, we see that the QRS is not normal and also the T wave is not normal. Okay, so we see abnormalities in the actual waves and their formations on the EKG as well. So arrhythmias are going to be where the heart rate is not maintained like it should. It's abnormal. Sometimes this can be controlled by medications. Other times we may need to put in a pacemaker to help with this. Some other arrhythmias that we can see are premature early contractions. These are known as PVCs. Okay, where we talk about preventricular contractions. And you can see this here where we just had a QRS and a T and then we have this kind of wider wave. That is what we call a PVC. This is where the atria or the ventricles contracted when they were not supposed to. Now, this is a precursor a lot of times to what we saw with the fibrillations where it's uncontrolled. If you throw a lot of these PVCs in a row, eventually the heart may just go into an uncontrolled quiver. That's a major problem. So a lot of times with arrhythmias, guys, they may not need treatment because it's not causing an issue. But if they do, we do see that if symptoms do come into play, we're going to need to treat them with either medications or again with a pacemaker.